poker's legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. What is happening, my loyal listener? Thank you for joining me once again for another episode of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. I'm your host, Brad Wilson, and in this episode, I'm going to be speaking with one of the hardest working human beings to ever step into the world of poker, Jennifer Shahadi. Jennifer has a list of credits, accomplishments, and accolades that most people could only dream of achieving, and she doesn't appear to be anywhere close to stopping anytime soon. Before poker, she first showed her impressive talent for strategic games in the world of chess. She became a national master at the age of 16 and was the first female to win the U.S. Junior Open. She has won two U.S. Chess Olympic Championship titles as well as a silver Olympic medal. Jennifer is currently the Women's Program Director at U.S. Chess, acting as an ambassador, host, and fundraiser. She's also on the board of the World Chess Hall of Fame and hosts Grand Chess Tour events with top players all over the world. In addition to being the author of two books about the game of chess, Chess Bitch, Women in the Intellectual Sport, and Play Like a Girl, Tactics by Nine Queens, she also hosts the Ladies' Night, that's Night with a K, Chess Podcast. She's also, of course, made a name for herself in the world of poker, currently working as the Mind Sports Ambassador at PokerStars. To name just a few of the highlights from her poker career, she took down the Open Face Poker Championship in Prague, a tournament she didn't even plan on playing in. She made it down to the final four of the PokerStars-sponsored winner-take-all shark cage and became the first female coach at Run It Once where she put together poker strategy videos from 2014 to 2018. She also hosts her own poker podcast, The Grid, where she discusses a specific hold'em starting hand with a different guest in each episode. Her goal is to go through the entire grid of 169 possible starting hands. At the time of this interview, there are 21 episodes sitting there ripe and ready for you to listen to. She's also in the world of public speaking, having given a TED Talk in Baltimore, guest lectures at MIT, Yale, and her alma mater, NYU, as well as speeches at the Philadelphia Art Museum, Dolly Museum, and Oakland Museum of Contemporary Art. As if all of that weren't enough, she and her husband also worked together to create fantastic art pieces that have been featured in such places as the Boston Sculptors Gallery, Contemporary Museum in St. Louis, as well as the previously mentioned Dolly Museum. As you've probably guessed by now, Jennifer is a grade A certified badass, and just reading her list of accomplishments makes me feel like a lazy bum in comparison. The opportunity to hear her words, advice, wisdom, and warnings are invaluable. So once again, this is your host, Brad Wilson. And without any further ado, here's my conversation with the amazing Jennifer Shahadi on Chasing Poker Greatness. Jennifer, how are you doing this morning? Great. It's good to have you on the show. I've been looking forward to this since... uh, you agreed to come on. I guess that's a few weeks ago, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, congratulations on your podcast. Um, it seems like it's uh, you've got so many interesting guests, and it, you know, it's uh, it's really a pleasure to be on the show as well. Thank you very much. And, and I have had just amazing guests. It's been an incredible, incredible experience so far. Typically, starting out the show, I ask. Let, tell tell me the story of how you got into playing cards in the first place. Well, I got started in poker because my brother became a professional poker player during the poker boom. He actually got into poker bef- even before that. And at the time I was finishing up NYU and also just finished my first book, uh, Chess Bitch. And that seemed like a good time to learn poker. He taught me how to play like sitting goes and 
I didn't really get into it that seriously. I enjoyed it. And I also went out once a year to like the World Series of Poker to play the ladies event and some sit and goes, but I never went like full force to try to become a professional poker player. So I kind of like dabbled in it for many years. What year was that? Um, between the years of, I guess, like, uh, 2005 to 2010, I was, or maybe 2006 to 2011, I was like, definitely like dabble. I learned poker and then I was just kind of dabbling. And what was the catalyst to getting more serious about the game? Well, I think part of it was I moved from New York city to Philadelphia. So it was a little closer to AC and I, also prior, I had a boyfriend who wasn't a poker player, but he seemed to have some issues with gambling. So it wasn't really a good fit to play when I was with him. So and that I, was maybe in that's, New York? Yeah, maybe that's part of it as well. And then, because you know how it is, if you're, that unfortunately, the gambling addiction is something that just, it's like alcoholism or something. It doesn't really go away very easily. So it's better to just kind of like keep it away if somebody has it. So um, I I moved to Philly and also Poker Stars was doing this like Poker Stars women stuff. And that really seemed very compelling to me because I always wanted to like go to these like glamorous live tour spots. But, you know, I was a chess coach and author. So I wasn't really making a lot of money. So, you know, trying to win, trying to play satellites to, you know, get into like a 25K or something in Monaco just seemed, I don't, maybe it wasn't 25K, but I think it, I think it were like 10Ks back then, the EPTs. And so it, it just didn't seem like a easy proposition, but they started doing the same thing with women's tournaments. And then I got more into that and also um, started doing a little bit of work for Poker Stars before I became an ambassador. Yeah. So that really got in, got me more into it. And I just started doing better online and also watching videos and things like that. Why, why the women tournaments in, instead of the open events? Why, why were the women tournaments specifically more appealing? Oh, just p- purely because of logistics. It seems like Poker Stars was putting some money specifically into that. So they were just like, there were overlays and... So the value. Yeah, the value. And it was just easier to get in because instead of it being like a 15K package that you were trying to qualify for, meaning that you had to have a pretty large bankroll, it was like a 3K package that you were trying to qualify for. Maybe more of that exists now. But back then I felt like there, there wasn't that many opportunities to satellite into something that was in like the 3 to 5K range. It was, it was tend to be a bit bigger. Yeah. And they probably didn't care because they were probably trying to expose more women to grow their population and grow their brand in general. So they don't care if there's overlays. They, they want to give out as much, many packages as possible, I would think. Absolutely. I mean, clearly it was a marketing strategy to get more women involved. I mean, you see that in chess as well. I'm actually the director of uh, U.S. Chess Women, and we definitely try to recruit more women. And a lot of that is via opportunities for tournaments that are exclusive to women or not even always tournaments, also just like networking events. Like we have these uh, clubs in some of our major events where girls can come and just like kind of socialize because sometimes they don't know other girls that play chess and those are incredibly popular and really useful. So I think in poker, there's like the same kind of thing. Like that's what, how I kind of see ladies events that they're a networking opportunity for women who maybe don't have friends in the game yet. And I mean, at at their best, that's what they should be. And so Warren Buffett said that, women make him optimistic about the future of America and that, you know, for so many years, a shamefully large percentage has been on the sidelines. Do you think this is true? Like in a poker sense as well? And do you think like, how how do, how does the poker world, the poker universe go about being more inclusive? I think that to answer part of your question, I mean, it's such a big question and gender, Gender issues are such a big part of my life in terms of my work, both philanthropic and professional and creative. I'm always kind of thinking about gender and sometimes it's uh, even exhausting, but I think that things are getting better. Obviously, I mean, look at the Democratic presidential candidate. So women are certainly infiltrating lots of fields that they didn't before. Um, But I think that sometimes things seem better than they actually are in terms of a lot of things with diversity in America. Like I think we get really good 
at showcasing our progress while there are underlying um, structural issues that aren't solved. And you see this, of course, with uh, racism in America as well, that the the laws are much more protective, but then there are certain structures that have never gone away from you know the police to the prison industrial complex. And with uh, gender, I, I think there's similar things going on. Like, yes, um, women can do anything, but there's no um, parental leave policies and, or there's very, very little parental leave policies and there's no national child care. And so sometimes the optics are awesome in America, but like underlying issues are just kind of like led to rest. And people hope that, you know, the average hardworking American isn't going to be, is going to be too busy to kind of notice them because they take a lot of unraveling and life experience to like see them there. And, and lots of these, these things, like you said, they're systematic, they're process problems that start very early on in our lives and sometimes just subconsciously learned behavior from generation to generation, which makes it a very complex issue in, in solving. But um, poker specifically, you know, I, I log on my Twitter, I see an old man dressed up as a Chippendale dancer dealing at a ladies event. Why, why, why does that happen? Like, I just, it, it kind of boggles my mind. Right. You know, and there was so much criticism over that. I, I, and I, now I understand I'm reading more about how the dealers were told last minute about it. And it, it seems like a labor wise, it was a really, really poorly executed idea that, you know, would potentially just be illegal in the United States. So, um, that is really unacceptable, but I also found it quite interesting, the image as an image, not that image as much, maybe like, no, that, that one too, that one's interesting. And just all these images, there were such a strong reaction that people had to the images, mostly negative. And I found it very interesting because even though people had this negative impression of the images, they kept sharing it, right? <laughs> yeah, so, it's, it's disruptive, I think. It's something you don't see all the time. Yeah, but it's kind of weird. It's like you're criticizing something, but you're also spreading it. It's like kind of fun to criticize it, which to me says that there's something interesting about the image that we maybe need to discuss. And it is um, clear that it, certainly in casinos, uh, the objectification of women is so commonplace that you almost don't even notice it's like invisible. And when it's an objectification of a male, the naked man, clothed female, it is so shocking. And I think that that is, that's interesting. And if it was performed in a more artistic concept that was totally consensual, where the dealers weren't getting it sprung on them and the women who were playing weren't getting it sprung on them, I think it would really be interesting. But the actual context was, was not good. I, I, I say this because I've done a lot of art and chess with um, involving nudity. And so I, that was like kind of the first thing I thought of when I thought of that image. I thought of like a lot of my work and like just the fact that there are so many more male artists and female artists in museums, but then there's also so many more female nudes, right? So that is just kind of like a, a <laughs> an important topic, right? Yeah. I, for me, it's like, it, it's the idea. It's a systematic idea behind it. Is like, how did it go through? Like, why, why, why was it a good idea to begin with? I think that's that's like, there are better ways, right? Well, I think the idea basically was that it would shock people because normally you're used well, to it seeing. Did. Yeah, I mean, if I did it, the idea would be to sh to show how we perceive male nudity versus female nudity in the context of a casino, and also to talk about the objectification and the exploit of dealers because they often don't have as much power as they should. Um, and, you know, wages are sometimes quite low and abuse is um, omnipresent as well. So I thought, I think like, to me, it is kind of like interesting from that point of view, but it should be done with like artists or models, not with actual dealers who are not interested in performing <laughs> like they're interested to deal cards not in participating in some kind of like performative work right <laughs> exactly and you mentioned something before is like you know why like if everybody's so outraged why does it keep getting shared and shared and shared and, and that's something that I, i've thought a lot myself and i'm going to take us off topic here i uh, just going on a tangent but like the same is true in like true crime type things where yeah the serial killers kind of get fetishized and 
so much attention gets focused on them and, and then the victims are completely unknown and, and yeah. they just get lost in the pages of, of history, which to me is, is very tragic. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I mean, this is something that I that I, I felt very strongly about for many years, um, that this true crime genre has to be really um, sensitive to that. And I mean, my basic rule of thumb for that is like, of course, we should still make mo- movies about the Holocaust and slavery and horrible ills of society, serial killers, but they have to be really good, you know, like in order to like raise the bar of that, like kind of pornographic prurient interest that you're appealing to, I think, and the fact that you're using this graphic negative imagery, I think that you have to like rise to the occasion and make something that's a really good work of art to me, for me to think that it's good. Like my bar is greatly raised. Like if you make an average comedy, it's like, okay, I'm not offended. But if you make an average movie about the Holocaust, it's like, yeah, you know, GTFO. Like I don't, I don't need that. We don't need that imagery unless it's going to be really good. And, you know, there's a really um, good book I was just reading yesterday on the plane about um, Lolita uh, by Nabaka, this, you know, great masterpiece of English literature and some of the inspirations of true crime that it was that he drew from, um, including a story about a woman who was um, kidnapped and taken all across the country, right from my area, actually, in Camden, New Jersey, which is really close to Philadelphia. And that, I mean, I, I'll never be able to think of that book, Lolita, in the same way as you see that this fictional character is actually based on like the pain of real women. And, you know, of course, the male author, g- a genius, but doesn't really seem like a great person when you read interviews about it with him. And it, it's difficult. It's something that I think we have to ruminate on a lot more now as some of our favorite artists get, you know, the book thrown at them because of the Me Too movement and um, increasing awareness of the importance of like, you know, gender equality. It's really interesting. And, and the other one that is just phenomenal is the red parts. It's all about our relationship with negative imagery of females and um, in, in rape and, and murder. And it's just absolutely brilliantly written. You should totally read that. You'll never, you'll never look at true, true crime in the same way. Awesome. I uh, told you that I was going to take us off track. And now we've gone off track <laughs> into the true, the true crime genre. Um, but you, you were asking me about poker and women and... Yeah, like, basically, and like you said, you know, dealers are abused. Dealers are in this horrible, horrible, horrible way. I've been at the poker table where women have been treated very cringeworthy at a poker table. And because of this, I ask myself, like, I have two young daughters. Would I be interested in them learning to play poker and just going out there in the world and playing poker? And I'm, I'm undecided because of the negative aspects that, that I've witnessed myself. And I guess my question is, you know, how do we do better as a poker community? Hmm, it seems like there's a lot of attention to this topic of uh, harassment and stopping harassment at the table. And the general consensus is that uh, people should step in more to stop the bad behavior. I think like beyond the table too, just this uh, idea of locker room talk and nasty things said about women. I think that it's something that if you're around other women, like it's kind of a little bit more self-policing, but then it could spill out over into the poker table. So I think it's something that men should work on amongst each other as well. Uh, Oh, a hundred percent. I'm very ashamed at the times that I've had an opportunity to say something and I didn't. And there've been plenty of those just because it felt uncomfortable in the moment or you're playing at a home game and like you're invited there and you don't want to offend somebody. But I look back at those times where I could have spoken up, I could have said something and I didn't. And uh, that, that fills me with a lot of regret. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's hard, you know, because people now are saying like, you should always say something, but sometimes it could be annoying you know, and it could draw even more attention to an issue that would otherwise be shrugged off. So I think it really is case by case. Yeah. So my shameful yeah. ones are very, <laughs> they're very severe cases um, where somebody sh- ought to have said something. I mean, I have to say, though, that's not really what I think. Like, I think that that's just like this more the superficial part of poker. And it's true. It 
turns people off and that's really terrible. People like me who deal with like way worse stuff when I'm like doing like streaming and from the chess oh, world. Yeah. I I usually don't have as big of an issue of that as be, because I just feel the, the people who are doing it are usually not, I mean, honestly, they're usually not really good players that I admire for the first part. They're usually people that I kind of see as, if they're doing that, there's just a good chance that they're, sorry, like not as smart. This this is the obvious, yeah. the, the obvious correlation, right? It is, yeah. This is why people don't stand up to them more often because most of the time they're a whale who think they can just do whatever they want or say whatever they want. Or somebody who's on tilt. And these days, it's not like it was during the poker room. If you're somebody who tilts a lot, you're probably just not a winning player. <laughs> like, I mean, it, it's it's hard to be um, winning a lot. The edges are smaller. So like if you're a tilt monkey who's going to say something nasty to a woman because you're not running well, there's a good chance you're not good at poker. Like I'd say very, very high. I can't remember anybody good at poker <laughs> saying something. I mean, there, but there, there is flirting. So like that's where it gets tricky. Like... There's flirting that can make somebody uncomfortable, but that's also like part of life. Like, so that's where, that's the one where like, obviously something that's just like nasty about a woman is something you should definitely say, but what do you do if you just see a man flirting with a woman and it seems like possibly she's not interested in that? Like that's really tricky because you also don't want to make it worse and draw even more attention to it. So I think there's a lot of, situations which are just like really um gray uh and it's it's not as easy as people make it out to be but i don't think that that's the main issue uh for me for me being a woman in poker probably the harder harder thing has been almost something i've also seen in chess in that people kind of want female friends to like even out male female ratios at parties just just you know to make things more fun um obviously potentially with other intentions as well and sometimes you'll find that women in both fields like chess and poker, they become friends with like the best players in the game very easily. Um, But those best players in the game often have other people to actually talk poker strategy with. So you sometimes get some weird imbalances where somebody is friends with somebody, but they're not actually interested in talking poker to them. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that can maybe actually bizarrely stunt somebody's growth. It's seen it happen in chess too. So that's why it's like, I'm, I'm very aware of it. I, I never considered that, but that is true. And, and even if it's not a woman and, and, you know, you mentioned that they make friends with the best players. So I'm speaking in this context. So typically the best players, especially if somebody's relatively new to the game, don't really want to discuss like beginner poker strategy or even really intermediate poker strategy. Because t- typically the people they hang around with are, are world class, and those are the people that they want because they're, they, there's value in it for them, right? We're, we're incentive driven creatures, human beings, and so the value from the top guy is speaking with another top player. Exactly, especially now that we've become more transactional and clickish as a subculture, I find that um, I, I I understand. I had Ryan Laplant on my podcast, uh, The Poker Grid, and he was talking a lot about how clickish poker is and how hard it is for people who don't make a lot of money or who aren't young white men to break into certain cliques. And he said that like that's one reason why he started his site. I think is interesting, and you know, of course, now there's just so many different training and strategy sites that. There are a lot more different price points than there used to be. Everything used to be so expensive. I feel that now people are kind of playing around with that, which could be good, as he mentioned, for getting things to be more uh, diverse. But yeah, I almost feel like, to me, that's like the bigger issue with poker, like how clickish it is. And if you're smart and perceptive and you're new to the game as a woman, you can maybe just like immediately detect that like all of these people who are making money are parts of these cliques that are like a little bit difficult to infiltrate. and. I I think that's, whether you're an older person also, like that's another population that can sometimes feel left out of different poker networks. I think that like, that's like more an issue that I have with poker socially. And you'll, you'll see people like talking at the tables about things. It's just like super antisocial. It's, (laughs) <laughs> it's just they're talking about stuff that like not everybody knows what the no no a lot of people can't join in in the conversation you know mm-hmm. 
just the human experience, it's a sample size of one, right? So like, that's why everybody has Mm -hmm. different perspectives on all these different things. I don't think that personally I've ever had a problem like infiltrating the cliques and, and they have felt inclusive as far as like different nationalities and different cultures, different people. But now that you mention it in none of those cliques has there ever been one woman. And I don't really know why that's the case. I, I mean, it's a percentage game too, most likely in that 98% of the people that I've played against in live poker, are typically male. I think being more conscious of of your behavior at the table in general and you know how to make things more fun and inclusive for everyone is definitely a positive. It's just not as easy. I don't think it's like an easy solution where you just have to be like, you know, more strident. I think you have to actually pay more attention, but that could be good because you might actually make more money at poker too if you're forcing yourself to pay more attention to those little cues, you know? For sure. Poker players are also not not exactly known for their social awareness, I think in general. Um, which might be another issue. But yeah, I was, so like I said, sample size of one as human beings, that that was sort of why I was asking, you know, your thoughts and, and your perspective, because I, I, I only see it from mine, right? And I, I'm sure that it's vastly different um, from your view. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I'm the kind of person who probably likes, you know, I like attention and I, Think that in poker and in chess, you have a survivorship bias where a lot of women who are put off by harassment, even small amounts that, you know, you might like laugh and like, oh, that's not a big deal. Um, Well, those people aren't playing poker anymore. So it's hard to judge like the people who still play poker as females tend to be really, really tough and strong and also probably like attention. So, you know, you can see that however you want to see it as good or bad or just good and bad in different ways. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes just talking to them isn't going to give you a clearer picture because you actually have to talk about the people who don't play poker anymore and they're not really interested in talking about poker. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. How do I find that person and get get them to talk about poker? Um, It's a tough sell. Yeah, it's really tricky. I just did an art piece actually in the, the World Chess Hall of Fame where I looked at the anger... Um, about the chess queen becoming the most powerful piece on the board over 500 years ago. So the chess queen used to be the weakest piece and now she's the most powerful. And when this happened, it was called the crazy woman's chess game, which I think gives you a sense of how people react to women who are empowered and and strong and faster than men. Um, So how did this come about? Why? Because the game was too boring. It, It took too long. Like the game without the queen being super strong was just very slow. It took forever. So the queen was part of it. She just got buffed buffed up. Exactly. And it also coincided with strong queens like Queen Isabella. So at that point, chess became a much better game. Women empowered, better game. Okay, makes sense. But there was also a lot of criticism. And there was one writer, artist who engraved this piece with a insult in French for the queen on each square of the board. Things like overly ambitious, um, hysterical, negligent, that kind of thing. She she devil. And so what we did, my husband and I created an updated version of this where we used a beautiful calligrapher to engrave insults for women on YouTube today who are chess champions. And the title of the piece is not particularly beautiful, as that was one insult that directed at me when I was doing a chess stream. Uh, And this is kind of a typical type of art these days where you use the negativity and the insults that people are directing towards you and reclaim them as something beautiful. So our piece, we felt, was very special, though, because it had this kind of like centuries of history. Yeah, that's incredible. Please send me a picture so that yeah, I, can, yeah, we'll I, can, I can share it on the, the show page. But that, that sounds awesome. So switching gears a little, I, last year, was it last year or the year before? Some year. You, you made a deep main event run um, with a little secret. Could you, could you tell me more about that? Yeah. So one of my most memorable WSOPs was uh, when I was secretly pregnant with my now two and a half year old son, Fabian. And 
it was really awesome because I was actually at this point in pregnancy where I was feeling really good. I had a wonderful pregnancy and except for like the beginning, the very beginning and the very end, I felt like it was almost like a superpower. I felt very relaxed, which is really important in poker, not to be too keyed up. And I think also just this sense of scale about what's important in life and what's not is even more evident when you're carrying another human being because you have two kids. So you might know um, there's all this math behind like pregnancy and miscarriage and like the odds of this and the odds of that. As a poker person, I was constantly looking at all these charts like, <laughs> yeah. all the time. And, <laughs> and just like, like this realization, like, okay, this 80% that, you know, if you take a pregnancy test really early on, it's actually only like an 80% chance that it'll work out because there's very, 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 very common for there to be early miscarriages. Thinking about that 80% versus 80% of winning versus like queens versus aces, I mean, winning aces versus queens. Um, it's, it's really, it's really sobering, you know, it just makes you realize that the luck that's involved in poker is so un- unimportant. Right? Yeah. It puts it in, in a perspective. Yeah. And so I had a deep run in this particular one and it was just so much fun. I had such a great time and I mean, it, w- it was really grueling. That's the thing. Like when you're pregnant, you need a little bit more sleep. So that was the hard part. It showed me like if there's one thing I could change about live poker tournaments would be definitely to make the structures less grueling. I hate, like I definitely play less. And this was even be true before I became a mom. Uh, but now it's even more true. I definitely think tournaments could be like, should be like eight hours of play a day, even if it's at the cost of making the structure shallower. And just start home earlier and end yeah. them earlier. I, I don't understand why I, they need to end at like 1 a.m., yeah, like I want to have a nice meal with my friends after I've already bad, you know, maybe if anything, like it allows people to maybe play some cash games or, you know, meet up with some of their friends. I, I think it's like way better, but I, I unfortunately, I think that I'm in the minority. Uh, maybe it's we, we are in the mini- minority, yeah. but the thing is like, you can't just switch it off at 1am, right? Like you have the adrenaline yeah. going through you. You can't just lay down in bed and get a good night's sleep. You're going to be up till three or four. Um, which to me is horrible because I'm in bed at 10 PM. <laughs> so going to bed at three is like a different world. And then the next day I'm definitely not optimized for play. Yeah. And you want to get a workout in. I just think that the, the EPTs, European poker tours, most tournaments in general in Europe, I think are a little bit more sane about their scheduling. Um, probably because in some countries it's impossible to get in and out of an, a restaurant in an hour. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like America where, where they're used to people being on this like speed track. That's definitely something I would change about poker tournaments. So when I was pregnant, that was particularly pertinent because I would get really exhausted. But I loved the experience. It's definitely one of my most memorable um, experiences in poker because I was just so happy and it was such a great time to play poker. Why, why was the pregnancy a secret by the way? Oh, because, um, it was a little, it was, it was a little later than I would have normally told. I would have normally had already told people, but I didn't want to because the WSOP main is so important. And I felt like maybe people would be asking me a lot of questions about it. Ah, gotcha. Yeah. So didn't want to dilute your focus. Yeah, exactly. That is the thing. I think for everybody in life, there are certain moments in your life where you just get asked the same questions over and over. Like for poker players, it's, you know, do you count cards? And <laughs> Yeah. You can make money doing that. That's always the first question. And then if you're a cab driver, it's like, where are you from? And if you're pregnant, it's when are you due? And is it a boy or a girl? And th- that's fine. I mean, people are curious about these things, but I think that you you certainly must know as an interview, and I've heard um, a previous one of your interviews with Q, and you ask great questions. And one of the important things I think about being a good interviewer is not asking the same questions that everybody always gets. Basically, you you don't want to go go just like totally wacky all the time. Like, what kind of tree would you be? Like, it's not like <laughs> it's not like you have to go off the deep end and be crazy. But I think just thought into questions. So you're not just thinking like the very first thing that comes to your tongue, j- just to give people the respect that they deserve at not to ask them something they've gotten a hundred times that day. 
it's a, it's a tricky thing. The thing the thing about conversation and stories is that when people tell the same story that they've told a bunch of times or they're confronted with the same question, it just goes into canned answers and it doesn't make for very compelling listening or conversation for the audience in and of itself. Exactly. And that's why it can be really hard to interview people right after they've like published a book or something. I've noticed that can be a tough time to interview someone because they're doing so many interviews that it's like they, they can't help themselves. It gets a little canned. Yeah. I think you, you still can do it. It just maybe requires even more work from the interviewer to make sure they're getting them out of that zone. For sure. You just have to figure out the angle, right? Figure out the right yeah. questions. And as a poker player, figuring out the right questions is pretty much what I do. Yes. And I had messaged you actually that I feel like there's this interesting corollary between, you know, most fields. It happens in poker. It happens in writing and interviewing, but particularly like interviewing in poker. I think there is some corollary in that you want to be prepared, but you also want to be ready to like deviate from your script. Absolutely. You know, if you only have one or the other, like you just have a great personality, but you do no preparation or you're really, really good at explaining people and reading people, but you don't know math and GTO, you're probably going to do okay, but not as well as somebody who kind of has both zones, right? And definitely only preparing really well and having a list of 10 questions and sticking to it, like you're going to stick to your exact ranges. That's definitely not ideal. Yeah, because the viewer or the listener just hears the same questions over and over. It becomes repetitive. And you're not reacting to the situation. Exactly. I mean, you're, you're more focused on ans- asking the next question than you are in listening to what the person is saying. Yeah. So when I have an interview, I, gen- I tend to have a bunch of questions and I have like two or three that like I really want to ask. And then the others are all just like optional based on whether or not the conversation takes us in a different direction. So, and, that, that, and I feel like that's an interesting corollary to poker. It's like, yeah, like these are my ranges that I know I've studied why the math is behind them. Be, you know, if things change, I have to be ready to change. And if you know anything about me, you'll know that sticking to ranges is like the <laughs> a- anti thing that I talk about. But uh, I do have actual questions that I prepared. <laughs> and I think I've asked maybe two of them so far. Um, I-, I watched your TED Talk. Uh, in preparation. You, you said that um, the thought process for coming up with, with a winning strategy in the chess tournament you were in was not that difficult, but it was identifying the right moment to think was what won you the victory. And so me as a poker player, and most likely the Chasing Poker great, Greatness audience can empathize. There's many situations uh, historically in our careers where we wish we would have thought more about a spot and the right answer would have you know, materialized, but we didn't. We acted too quickly. So the question is, how do you identify those moments at a poker table in real time? Well, that's really interesting. Um, interesting corollary, because sometimes in poker, it's more obvious than in chess because the pot's just gotten really big. You know, in chess, I say, hey, if there's like a bunch of pieces in the middle of the board and they're all threatening to take each other, like that's a good sign you should be thinking really hard. And sounds really obvious, but when you get tunnel vision and just start playing, it's not that obvious. People forget about that. And same with poker. Like, luckily, I think it is a little easier if the pot is inflating. There's a good chance somebody's going to slow down and think like, okay, like I, these are really critical decisions. That said, I also think that on the river, there are some situations where people maybe act too quickly um, or give things away too quickly that they're not considering that they're the type of that they're basically considering whether or not to check call or check fold, not even considering check raising. Um, so maybe that's a bit of a corollary, like when to continue to keep your poker face and make sure that you're considering all the options. And that's something that we see in chess a lot too, that people like to be prepared and they don't want to mess up big time. So sometimes they take safer routes and go down the same well-trodden paths. And I think you see that in poker too, where people will maybe not venture out certain parts of the game tree that they're most comfortable with, even though by virtue of you being less comfortable, your opponent's probably less comfortable too. So... It's and, and that's the point, right? It's not just about you. It's about whether or not you are more comfortable than your opponent, not if you are comfortable. 
if, if that makes sense. And that happens in chess a lot too. Oh, it, it makes absolute sense. Yeah. You create a really complicated position. So you're both going to make more mistakes. Exactly. An, an acquaintance of mine, Kyle Cottonseed Hinden, he said that, you know, there's always going to be an edge in poker, but it's just going to be deeper in the decision tree than it used to be. And sometimes people just get afraid of looking like an idiot and taking a, you know, venturing into the unknown. And that really stunts their growth just as a poker player. And um, sometimes, you know, we were talking about the the big river spots that, that should be thought about more. I think that early decision tree actions can often be uh, a point of emphasis as well. People just do something because for whatever reason that they think they should do it. Um, and it leads to that river spot where maybe they shouldn't have gotten there in the first place, but they acted too quickly on an earlier street. It becomes this like compounding snowball effect. Yeah. Well, I, I guess one reason I talked about rivers, because I feel like the river is more chess like than other streets, just because there's more, um, uh, there's more information and less unknowns and less like probability and math at that point, you know? So I think that it makes sense. It's kind of like the end game in chess. So, and it's obviously the first street that like solvers solve, right? Cause you know, it's less complicated. There's not as many different things that you have to calculate. And finally that you're often, it's the one street where you're able to think more if you want to, because depending on the type of situation, if it's just a call or a fold, you can just think as much as you want, right? For sure. Yeah, the, the correlation's there because it's there's a lot there's more concrete information on the river. There's no more variable. Um, you're not like on the flop. You're not f- solving for however many turns are left, and then however many rivers are left on top of it. So when you think about joy in your poker career, what's the first memory that comes to mind? Um, probably winning the open face tournament in Prague, uh, the, this high roller tournament in Prague that I won at like four in the morning after playing open face since like 11 a, or 12, noon or 1 PM that day. Um, that was a great feeling. Yeah. Felt really good. Cause it was like a, just a shock to, cause I wasn't expecting to actually play in the tournament and then I did. And then I won like 14 hours later. So that was a definitely a very joyous moment. I, I also think about winning my first heat of the shark cage because that also was a very important moment for me because I ended up winning a tournament equity entry that was like almost 200K. Um, Yeah, those are just two really joyous moments that kind of pop out. The open face, um, what led you to enter the tournament? You said you you almost didn't play. Yeah, you know how it is with like, I, if you're somebody who doesn't normally play high rollers and then you play one, it's always just a little complicated to get money. What's a high roller? What's the, what's it was, the buy-in? It was, te- it was 10K euro. So now that's definitely not a high roller. But back then it was the high roller for the OFC championship. And I don't, I think I was coming from like a chess trip. And so I didn't have 10K euro on me and I didn't want to like take like a huge beating or something. And it, it just, it, just it, was that, it was like starting in a couple hours. So it wasn't like I could like transfer easily from like a bank or something like that. So yeah, it was just a matter of linking up with somebody who had the euros to float me. I am a huge nit with this stuff. I never would ever, ever play plan to show up the morning of a tournament (laughs) and play a 10K. Yeah. Like even like tournament that has a low buy-in, I don't like to do that because I just feel like I'm going to be really tired, you know? Did, Did they float you or did they buy your action? Um, a little bit of both. It was a little bit of both. Yeah. So you didn't have, that was, that was their bonus for, that was their bonus for floating me. (laughs) You just taking it down. Yeah. That's, that's a a good bonus when you buy some action a few hours before (laughs) an event and they bink it. What is up? You future star of poker. You coach Brad here. And I just wanted to take a moment to let you know about PKC poker. If you're sitting there wondering to yourself, Why? Why is Coach Brad promoting this PKC Poker app thing? Allow me a moment to explain my why. Battling in cash games has been my livelihood for the past 15 years. It's how I survive and put food on the table for my family, which makes it imperative that I either test out or seek qualified opinions on all of the poker platforms on the market. One juicy find can mean the difference between a meh year and an amazing family vacation in Hawaii kind of year. With that said, I have tried almost all of the major poker apps on the market to date, 
and despite the hype about amazingly juicy games, have come away from the experience unsatisfied. I was just never able to find success against seemingly weak competition and in one specific case was getting outright destroyed by passive villains playing more than 50% of their hands. What on earth was going on, right? After many evenings sitting in the bathtub wondering if I had lost it, I finally dug into the data and learned something that shouldn't have been too surprising to you. These dudes were colluding and super using their pants off. So I swore off those free money, decentralized devil apps and decided to go back to my more familiar streets of ignition. It was then that I was contacted by a good friend of mine who turned out to be the vice president of worldwide operations at PKC. Him and I had a long, in-depth conversation about security, the ecosystem, and the future direction of PKC, and he managed to convince me to give it a shot. That shot turned into an incredible six months with an hourly rate that's about five times what it would have been playing on any other US platform. As it turns out, I didn't forget how to play. I just needed to be on a level playing field to return to my crushing ways. I have no doubt that you, my community, my audience is going to play online poker somewhere. And I want to be damn sure that you don't go through the pain and frustration I felt by messing around with any poker app besides PKC. This is why promoting PKC is a no-brainer for me. I love you, I love my community, and I want to put you in the best position to succeed at this game that we both love so much. So if you'd like to join me in the streets of PKC, simply head to EnhanceYourEdge.com slash PKCPod and get your invite code to play. You must have an invite code to play and you must be 21 years of age or older. One more time, that's EnhanceYourEdge.com slash PKCPod to get your invite code. Best of luck, and now, on with the show. Let's go to the opposite now. So when you think about pain in your poker career, what's the first memory that comes to mind? Well, the, uh, the, I was on the, so I mentioned I made the Shark Cage final, which Phil Ivey was in, and um, I got eliminated. What is the Shark Cage final, by the way? It was like this made-for-TV show that Poker Stars made, where there was a million-dollar free roll, and so we were. It was there was like six. There was like four of us left, and there was a million dollars for first. Yeah, and yeah. I first of all, I incorrectly. Well, I mean, I incorrectly called a check raise on the river by him, which really wasn't like the worst play ever because you know he de- like he. I, I saw a very similar betting structure recently where he was. I mean, listen, he could have been bluffing, basically. It's not like it was the worst decision ever. I do think it was a bad decision, but the proportion to which I was angry at myself was probably over, overly, you know? I was, like, really upset about it for a while. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot at stake, a lot of pressure. Yeah, and, you know, the thing is, like, I never get upset just from busting something, to be honest. Like, I'm really good, I think, at uh, separating uh, results from play um, unless they kind of coincide. So if it's like a big moment and you lose and you also feel like you played a hand badly, um, that's really hard, you know, because you're, you're seeping into the, both the disappointment and in the world, which is easy to take because, Hey, that shit happens every day. But when you kind of combine that constant, which happens, you know, ebbs and flows we know as poker players with feeling like you made a mistake, the combination can be very, very tough to deal with. And the stakes at play, I think, you know, you don't get many shots at a million dollar payday, especially with four people left. You can go for the rest of your life and, you know, you're not going to have that many of them, right? So like just that opportunity, I I could imagine is painful, especially if you feel like, you, you know, you made a mistake. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And yeah, that's, um, so that was probably, that's kind of the first moment that comes to mind for sure. And let's go to your, your process for regularly improving your game. What does that look like? Like specifically for you? For me, it's always very important to focus on high density study because I'm really busy and it's- What does high density mean? um, Things that are going to come up a lot. And that uh, means I'll be more likely to try to study and also things that are I'm either uncomfortable with and do come up a lot. So it seems really obvious, 
But I like to just study spots like, you know, 40 big blinds deep, button opens, big blind fans, like just stuff that I know is going to ha- happen a lot in tournaments. And then, you know, the flops that are most likely to happen, like ace high flop, right? Like just, but then sometimes I'll throw in things that don't happen as often, but I might feel uncomfortable with like, you know, a monotone flop, right? Like not as, mod- not as typical, but something that is easy to get wrong, partly because it doesn't happen as much. So I try to like find a mix of those things. Is it mostly early decision tree spots? Do I focus mostly on the flop? Yeah, I guess I would say I focus mostly on the flop because I think the flop kind of lends itself to then studying the rest of the hand as well. Yeah, so like, yes, I would focus first on the flop and then start thinking about some runouts. So yeah, like I would use programs to do that. But then one thing that's also really important for me is writing because I think that it's easier for me to retain things if I re-explain themselves to myself in English language because I'm a writer. And also I just think that it's an inordinate amount of data to retain. So it's very important to find a way to write it to yourself. I mean, I've been playing around a little bit with DTO, which I think is a great idea. I'm not sure it resonates with me specifically right now. Um, I like it, I like using it, but I think maybe um, it's like you want to use it as a supplement, I think, not as like your main way of studying. And uh, like I created this video on Run It Once a, a couple of years ago that I, I still use because, you know, sometimes I'm doing a chess thing for like weeks and weeks and I forget um, some of like my basic betting structure patterns. And I find it enormously useful, especially for live poker, where you don't see like, you know, the number of chips that everybody has at the table. And it's just a spreadsheet that I created that kind of tests you. Um, it's, a, it's a quiz that tests you on um, just getting all the money in by the river or the turn, depending on what you want to do. And, you know, looks at the different bet structure sizes. If you want to go like 1.2x on the turn and, you know, 80% on the, on the river, then how much did you make it on the flop? So it kind of tests you on that. And yeah, I can play around with that for like an hour. And I find that really helpful. And this is going back to what we were saying before, is uh, you don't take your time on the flop, you choose the wrong sizing, and then you get this awkward river situation where you're like, I got like 1.7 pot, how much do I want to value bet? Um, Whereas you could have just sized up on the flop, and this wouldn't even be an issue right now. Exactly, exactly. And that's just so freeing because it allows you to pay attention to other things. I mean, we all remember the first day we played live poker and it's just so overwhelming, all the chips and... Information the, overload, yeah. Yeah, but it still exists. It's just that we kind of focus on certain things and I do find it incredibly freeing to you know, have more comfort in bet sizing structures that you're using both exploitatively and theoretically because it just gives you more time to think about other things because it's the most, I mean, arithmetically and not arithmetic because there's multiplication and division, but like computationally, it's kind of the most, com- it's the most complicated task at the table. Like figuring out what your bet sizes are and, you know, how you're going to, you know, also physically and computationally, like how you're going to put them out and how you're going to divide them from flop. And then if you do get to the turn in the river, right? Um, so I think that it's just really nice to get that computation like... Out of the way. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And two, what you were saying about writing things down, there's lots of there's lots of uh, data in that, like if you have a, things you want to do tomorrow, if you physically write them down, the percentage chance that you actually do them the next day skyrockets because you know, you're physically writing it down, even versus typing it or putting it into your phone. So writing down the bits of knowledge that you want to retain, I would imagine is just super, super beneficial. I love writing things down, but I wonder, is that becoming a lost art? Like, are people still writing things down? I, I asked James Altucher this. I think he, he looks really, really young, but he is 50. And for him, it's like, yes, definitely when it's idea related or chunks of information to retain, I absolutely write it down. Um, I, I had James Altucher on my podcast as well. Who's like this, he's this uh, entrepreneur and podcast host, but he's also really great with like life hacking tips. And um, yes, he talked about writing them down on pen and paper. But like, do do 20-year-olds actually write things down on pen and paper? 
Like, do you see it often? <laughs> that, I, that I'm not sure. But like, I can show you like right here. Oh God, you can't see it. I have a book, basically. You can't yeah. see it. It's this stupid green it. screen. I see it. Okay. I see the outline of it. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a journal. Um, and I bought myself a fountain pen because I listened to a Neil Gaiman interview and he was talking about his process for creation. And basically his process is he gets a journal, he gets his fountain pen and he goes somewhere and he's got two options. He can either write or he can do nothing. Like he can either create something or he can do nothing. And both are fine. Like if you want to just sit at the pool and look at nature, then that's fine. But you have to do it for an hour. Um, and he finds that he gets bored after five or 10 minutes of doing nothing. And so he starts writing. And so like for my content, for the things that I create, um, like courses or webinars, I go to the pool and I just write in my journal or I do nothing. Yeah, it's phenomenal. I mean, that said, I love technology because if you have like, I, if you have insomnia and you're up in the middle of the night, you do kind of need that iPhone to like, you know, open up the notes, <laughs> you know, cause it's like, yeah, you know, when I came up with the idea for the poker grid, actually, I was in uh, the Bahamas and my son and husband were in the same room and I couldn't sleep at all. So I'm not going to like turn on the light and get it open. Yeah. So yeah, it's interesting though, but I'm, I do find I, I've written a couple of books and I find that writing on pen and paper is really valuable and I wish I did more of it. So it's good that we had this discussion because maybe I'll try that Neil Gamet's, um trick. Yeah, I actually wish that I would write more letters to my loved ones and send them like in the mail, even though I don't think I've ever done that since I was like 12 years old. But it's like something that's in the back of my head that I want to do is to send more letters and write things out by hand. Um, because I just think it's more powerful to see it from just from the, the receiver's perspective. It's more valuable, in my that's opinion. That's interesting. Because I also think that, you know, that's beautiful and like you should just do that for the holidays. But I also think that even just a letter that's like written on MS Word and printed out and put in a nice envelope with like, a, if it's for your daughters with like stickers and like, you know, I think it's even just the fact of getting something in the mail that's paper and signed and is embellished. It's also quite nice, right? For sure. And they're both nice, but I can tell you for sure, like I, I have letters that like my daughter ha has written me and I can see her handwriting. And like over time, you know, you can see the handwriting change and they're just the most valuable things. Like they're, they're just treasured keepsakes forever. It gives you an image of who they are and where they're at by seeing the handwritten notes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's really special. And luckily, it's a goal that you have that's that, that hard to achieve. Just do it. I know. I know. <laughs> um, what, what would you say is the, the most high-impact thing you've done over your career to improve your poker game? Oh, well, probably like just solvers. Solvers? But I mean, it's hard because I feel like solvers have greatly increased my understanding of poker, <laughs> like a lot, but to the difference between understanding of poker and actually just like winning more money is not always directly correlated. Um, so, uh, but that said, I think for most people really being able to understand, not necessarily even solvers, even if it's like a more rudimentary program, not like one of the most, you know, the most aggressive is using like uh, technology to aggregate and chunk data so that you can memorize it more easily and then combining that with writing things down. Like, I think that's like the perfect combination because you're using like the highest end technology, but then you're also using like your very human brain and trying to kind of merge them. We, I've, I've spoken about this so many times. I'm sure the audience is sick of me talking about GTO and how it's impossible to implement theoretically into a game for the most part. As a baseline strategy, it's okay. Like you said, you learn more, but it doesn't necessarily improve your poker game, um, if that makes sense. No, but, definitely uh, not. Especially not like short term. Right. People like, but but I think as humans, human beings, you know, we want the magic bullet. We want the answer. We want somebody to say, "Hey, this is what you should do in this situation." Then we memorize it, and then we just turn into a computer and make the decision at the table. But as history has shown it's very good that that's not the case because else bots would just rule the world. And oh yeah, the other thing I've done that probably is maybe even more helpful is uh, playing heads up. That's been really helpful for me because I feel like I've had a lot of growth in my game when I started playing heads up, even though I never became like a full, like a big heads up player, but I played like a lot. 
both cash games and sitting goes. And I help, I think it helped me enormously get into like the kind of game flow, not just thinking, um, but also dancing, playing. I think it's very easy as an intellectual or want to be intellectual or somebody who likes to think about things and break them down to just get too much into thinking and poker is about playing and heads up forces you into that zone. I think as a chess player, it's particularly powerful for me, for me because I was able to kind of just like hop right into that headspace. But I, I love heads up because you're forced to play poker, not just think poker. And that is a really important experience for most people, I think. If they're, especially if they're like starting to study too much or feel like they're getting into a zone where they're not being playful enough. Um, it's really useful. Um, where do you play heads up at? Well, I, I'm not really playing a lot right now. Not right now because it really, well, first of all, poker stores PA is coming any minute, like literally like next, by the time this interview is aired, it might be, might be home. Yeah. But you know, um, yeah, like over the last, like I'd say like when I started playing heads up a few years ago, I felt like I saw a massive growth in my my level, especially if I got into shorthanded situations. The problem is actually using that headspace you find in heads up and trying to apply it to full ring when you're bored a lot of the time. That that's the challenge. That's what's really hard. But I feel like like if you could copy paste that, that would be like the ideal. Although you'd probably get tired after like a 12 hour day. So you can't, you need, you would need to, you need to like tweak it a little bit, but when I'm playing well, I feel like I'm more in that kind of flow of a heads up feel, not like a full ring feel, even if I am playing full ring. Um, and that doesn't mean playing a lot of hands. That just means being in a more playful mood rather than just kind of like thinking when it's your turn and then the rest of the time being distracted. And that's, you mentioned the dance, which is a really beautiful way to put it when you're playing heads up you know, you're dancing with somebody, it's a psychological battle as much as anything. And talk about uncomfortable situations. You're, you're just going to get yourself involved in uncomfortable situations in spots that you're unsure of. And the more spots that you get into that you're unsure of, that you're aware of, and then can study afterwards, I think that that, you can identify a lot of areas of growth in your poker game. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a lot of fun. It's I know that it's not as popular as it once was online for various factors. And, you know, whether it's rake or edges or bots or all sorts of things, but or people just not wanting to play unless they know they have an edge, so creating issues. But I just think in terms of purity, it's just like such a fantastic poker game. I mean, it reminds me of chess. It reminds me of playing heads up open face where there's all these psychological issues of momentum and tilt. Even people that normally don't tilt, you put them in a heads up situation, whether it's whatever the game is, that, that's going to be exposed, whatever your tendencies are, whether you shut down and bluff less or whether you start bluffing more. And that's incredibly powerful because maybe that's the same tendency that if you're playing full ring and you're in the highest stake situation you've ever been in um, and you're having some swings with your stack, that could be the same tendency that's cropping up, right? So I think that that's why it's so powerful, I think. Yeah, that that's great, great wisdom for folks out there. Um, play some heads up, play some heads up poker. Sometimes, you know, I, I spoke to Jungle Man on the podcast as well and he took the reverse game selection approach uh, when he first started out and just playing people that were better than him, um, which may not be intuitively a great way to make money, but if the goal is to become a better poker player, then it makes a little bit more sense. Yeah, sure. If you can afford to play like certain, if you can afford to play people who are better than you and hence up and then, you know, like lose the least amount of money possible and then make money via the the improved player you are um, live or online yeah, that seems like a good strategy potentially I mean hey if it worked for Jungle Man yeah Jungle Man's kind of a freak though so imagine there's a carbon copy of yourself she's 20 years old and she's just beginning her poker journey you can have a sit down conversation with her what wisdom do you give her well I'd probably say to play um, mix to try playing mixed games. Cause I think that I got, I'm kind of like addicted to no limit hold'em in a way, like I like not in like a bad way, but I think it's like a, it's just like a bit of a rabbit hole, and that it's like very intellectually exciting, and it 
gives you this precision where you can understand every nook and cranny, which I think people like that. They like to control things and they want to be good at good at the games that they're playing. But because poker is about making money, it's, I think it would have been good. I, I, I kind of wish that I, I played more mixed games because that's all about like relative strength. Right. And then I'd also say to, um, you know, think big. What does that mean? Think big. Um, I think it's important to have, have, um, big goals. I mean, you want to plan for them, but I think that it's important to have, um, big financial goals when you're, when you're really young. What's a big goal? Um, setting yourself up for financial freedom, making enough money so that you can take several years off if you want to start having a family. Yeah. I mean, like not that you'd want to take several years off because then you might just be completely out of the zone of whatever you are that is your doing, but that you could, if you wanted to. Yeah. The option. And for the folks that I've interviewed that have been in the game for 15 years or so, there's certainly this burnout effect that does happen where poker players, they're, they're in it for so long, all they want to do is get out, but then they realize they're not really qualified for anything else in the way, uh, that they have access to at the moment. Um, I know. I know. I mean, I've, I've, I don't have that problem because I've always done so many things outside poker. I guess that's like, I've always had like the opposite problem that I never feel like I'm able to get put in quite the amount of volume that I'd like to in poker. But I'm not sure that I convinced that I would, I'm creativity is so important to me. Like, I'm not sure I would tell myself to go, to go and only do poker because I think that to me, for my type of brain, it's really good to be involved in a lot of things. Um, but yeah, definitely I would, uh, probably just play less, probably play less like, um, long MTTs with big fields, you know, less and focus more on cash. I mean, yeah. And smaller, maybe on smaller tournaments. And that's why, like, I think mixed games would have been uh, a good, a good idea for me. Um, but yeah. And then in terms of it's hard, I mean, it's hard to, it's a hard question. Because obviously a lot has gone well for me in poker also. So I'm thinking about things like th- that would have created a better scenario, you know, without, without throwing out the things that worked out, you know what I <laughs> without mean? Without throwing out the good things, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I think th- there's a trap too. And I'm not a specialist in mixed games. I've played some pot limit Omaha, but never really the other mixed games at any level. And the problem, at least for me as a cash game player, is that I have a certain hourly rate. And spending time on these other games, I know that my hourly rate is going to be lesser in the short term, which basically means that I've stuck to what I've known and No Limit Texas Hold'em and haven't really progressed. But I know that, especially in a live casino setting, when you're moving up and playing high stakes, uh, what a lot of pros do is they will, you know, a recreational player will come in that wants to play relatively big and they're okay with playing a mixed game. So they just start like a three game mix and then they play them heads up or three handed. And like the three game mix automatically, boom, eliminates all of the strictly no limit hold'em players from even having an opportunity to play. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I guess just more it just just to answer your question very literally, I would give myself a list of people that I should trust and not trust. <laughs> but you're saying it's a 20 year old now, so it's actually a different 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 world. You're a different person. Yeah, poker is a different world now. It always is. It change. It's constantly changing. Are there any commonalities in the attributes of people to trust and not to trust? Any patterns you've seen? Well, there's probably some inverse relationship between charisma and who you should trust, but. You know, there's some charismatic people who are trustful or trustworthy, but you have you have to be a little bit more careful. And then, um, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard, honestly. You know, because poker players are. I, I I mean, I've got I haven't gotten honestly I haven't gotten scammed very much myself, but I've I've seen a lot of people have, and it's very difficult when there's a game in which people are masters of deceiving others. It's going to be harder than reading people in real life, right, and knowing who to trust. So I imagine people like who live in LA and are part of like the um, film industry are probably the best equipped to read poker players. Cause I think that's like, that's where I'm, I, I'm, I'm not part of that world. I do a lot of media projects, but I've never lived in LA, but I feel like that might be where there's the most overlap from what I've seen. 
uh, as far as like figuring out who's mm-hmm. scamming and who's not scamming. Yeah, about who you can trust and who because really... they deal with actors. Is that their? Well, it's not just about scamming. I think it's also about you know who you want to work with, who you want to work with, that kind of thing. Yeah, because I mean, scamming is like the obviously the low end, but it's also about finding people that it's not going to be you're not going to be wasting your time on. You know, like a business relationship type yeah, exactly. type deal. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's tough to know who to trust in poker. And I think that my default has been over the years to not really trust many people, especially with financial stuff, like having fun going out, that sort of thing. But like the the staking, all that stuff ha- for me has always been very, very controlled as far as who to stake, who to give money and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's a good, that's a good uh, life philosophy, but you also, you know, you have to sometimes do that if you want to get get money back. So that's why it's like, it's easy, like never a lender or a borrower be, but I I think that you have to make some exceptions and that's where the poker skills really come in. (laughs) Right. You have to control as much as you can control, I think, in those situations. And the less, less you can control, the more apt for bad things um, to happen. The more often bad things happen. Then you you also hear these stories of like, old timers who will sell action to themselves and sell like 200% of the action and then bust themselves on purpose. I've heard stories of that as oh well. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Where wow. like these guys, they're like, Oh yeah, I had a piece of him. And they're like, Hey, I had a piece of him too. And they like all get together and like calculate it and realize like, Holy shit, he sold 200% of himself and then bust it on purpose. But yeah, there's a lot of landmines that you got to avoid. Yeah, but it's a really fun game and I would still recommend people to play it because I think right now we're having, we're experiencing some, some like mini boom effects um, because of all the content out there related to poker. It just seems that there's so much of it, which is making the game seem a little bit more inclusive, um, which is great. And it does seem that there's more tours like Lex Live and Run It Up that are more focused on like having fun and not just playing. Which I think is really good for people getting into it because if you're going to be losing money, you should be having fun. Of course. Um, and yes. so I think that's, and that, you know, it's, it's a really like, remember when people used to call the WSOP adult summer camp and it, you know, you don't want poker to lose that fun feeling. And I don't think it has, you just have to find the right places to find it. And I do believe that there's more extroverts and like, people kind of flowing into poker partly because of this like streaming and content. And so it's it's probably not a bad time to get into it, but I think your financial goals have to be like both ambitious, but also realistic at the same time. Like you want to have like an ambitious plan if things do work out and start going in your direction, but also, you know, you need to have other sources of income. Ideally you just are somebody who loves to work and you can both be ambitious, but also had some alternate streams of income that help you. I mean, like I've never been good at saving money. I, uh, well, it's not that I'm not good at saving money. I love to work, but I, whether it's poker or other types of things, but I, I like to spend money also. Yeah. You're human. Yeah. Well, you know, (laughs) we get the dopamine release when we, we buy something. Yeah, exactly. And obviously if you can reduce that a little bit, it's, It's really good for most people. For me, I'm not so sure because I find that the most powerful thing is to not think about money very much. So I feel like if you can, if I can keep my core expenses low, like transportation, housing, and insurance and stuff, and then keep like, you know, random spending, like eating and clothes, just, you know, don't do it too much, but also don't be like super, you know, meticulous about it. I think that's like a good workable solution for me. What's like the most ridiculous thing that you've spent money on? Oh, definitely clothes related. Definitely like shoes that I've like never worn that were like a stretch, you know, like there were like like, like $600 shoes that I bought after like a cash game session and like they're gorgeous, but they're like museum pieces and they're like impossible to wear. Um, After I had a baby, I, I actually just gave a bunch of them away. I didn't even try to sell them because I feel like one of the great things about clothes is it's so beautiful. If somebody who's not using something and that's like brand new and designer and they can like start incorporating it into their outfits, it just like feels so good. Especially if it's somebody who doesn't normally buy that kind of stuff. I'd rather give somebody that feeling than, you know, sell it at like 10% of what I bought it on eBay. 
Right. Yeah. That, that that's awesome. Yeah. It's <laughs> they're they're getting use out of it, and it makes them happy, which makes you happy. So, at the end of the day, maybe six hundred dollars for shoes you never wore wasn't a complete waste, right? <laughs> <laughs> I could have put it on Bitcoin. Uh. <laughs> that's <laughs> the ten percent on Bitcoin. <laughs> Eight years ago, those shoes. <laughs> Oh, those are some expensive shoes now. So let, let's fast forward 15 years from today. I know it's hard to do, but what are your accomplishments in the world of poker going to look like? Well, I'm looking at um, definitely a book, and a poker-related book, which I'm very excited about. Obviously, I'll have completed the grade. And, you know, Poker Stars is coming to PA. And so I think that's going to be very exciting for me in terms of being able to play um, much more regularly. I mean, 15 years from now is a long time. So I wonder if poker will change a bit, if maybe we're going to be playing different types of formats online. Um, but I I guess I want to still be... By f- different formats, what do you mean? I think, I don't know. Maybe people will gravitate towards Annie only. Maybe Annie only, no limit tournaments will be much more popular. I think there will be some tweaks just to kind of keep people with wider ranges so that it's a little bit harder to use solvers, especially in game. Unfortunately, I, well, good news and bad news. I have a feeling that live poker, especially tournaments in like five to 10 years, you won't be allowed to use your phone at the table, but that the, therefore the tournament structures will get shorter. I think that there will, there will be some kind of um, reaction like, Shorter t- tournament formats, but very, very limited phone use. Why do you think those two go together? Well, because if people people don't have their phone and they can't contact their families and their work, they're not going to want to play tournaments. Maybe, maybe there will be a way to do like maybe by then there will be like an app that like you can you that you can like instantly see whether somebody has on where it's like I don't know, but even texting like texting only or something. I don't know. But you definitely can't, you definitely, as poker programs become more and more powerful, I think it's going to be tricky. It's, it's going to be tricky for tournament organizers. And maybe just shot clocks will help because it's very difficult. If the pace picks up, it'll be harder for people to use their phones to get like information. But um, I think there'll be some changes. Maybe shot clocks is better than no phones because I think no phones will reduce the playing numbers too much. This is where we are as human beings, where we, the, just the thought of playing in a poker tournament without our phone being available is like dramatically reduces the number of entries into a field, which is kind of funny to me. Like thinking back 25 years ago, there were no smartphones 25 years ago, right? And, and like you're at a poker tournament. So like communication with family and friends is like not even, shouldn't be that a big deal, I wouldn't think. But there's a lot of downtime, so people are just going to get bored. Yeah, I actually, maybe I'm wrong though. Maybe there will be phone, still phone usage because I, I just don't think it's going to fly with the way people behave now. But I think that there will be some changes in the rules. Maybe it'll be like a 30 second, like 30 second, like well implemented shot clocks and you can use your phone at like designated times, you know, like when a new dealer comes in or during a shuffle. Designated f- phone times. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> you have a phone clock. I'm going to play my phone clock card now. <laughs> yeah, check, exactly. I need turn to my like, phone off. My son. <laughs> <laughs> if you had ultimate authority, um, these tinkerings, if you had ultimate authority to improve the game of poker, what's something that you would do straight away? And I know that you being you, you've had to have thought about this. Well, definitely. Uh, I think that the shot clocks should be figure be implemented um, more regularly, even though they'd be hard for me because I like to think. I think that it's just an important growth of the game. I think that shorter days is it, but that's a that's a perfect that's a perfect combination. I think our goal should be to have the same number of hands, but in less time. Oh my god! Of course. All right. So a couple more questions. We'll get you out of here. Um, what's your current big goal in poker? Um, my big goal in poker, well, I, I, I generally have process-oriented goals. So with online poker coming to PA quite soon, my big goal is to um, really improve my understanding and execution of the game. And also to finish the poker grid and to use it as an inspiration to occasionally play hands that I wouldn't normally play for fodder on the show, just to get myself out of 
a rigid zone. And so it could be like a bit of more of like an experiment at lower or mid stakes, uh, but something that I think will be useful for me because I can sometimes, even though I'm a creative person outside of poker and chess, I want to make sure that when I'm playing, that personality is also coming out because it's not always the case. Right. It's easy to get rigid and mm-hmm. fall, in, fall into patterns. Um, tell, tell, me, tell the audience about the grid in case they're unf- unfamiliar. So the Poker Grid is a podcast I'm doing where I'm interviewing a different guest for every single cell in the 169 cell poker grid. So 13 by 13. So we have guests on every hand from aces to seven deuce offsuit. So obviously some of those hands are going to be really tricky to fill in like, you know, nine deuce off or something like that. And that's where I think, you know, having having to fill it out myself as this creative project could be an interesting way to merge my creative self with my more um, rigid gaming self, you know, which I feel like I mentioned earlier, heads up being a great way to feel more flow, you know, and I'm always looking for ways to do that because sometimes let's just face it, like full ring poker can get boring. So I, this, I think it's really good to kind of make, make sure that you're staying awake. You know, you can't manufacture it though, right? Like you can't just get the Jack Deuce and go absolutely crazy. It's got to kind of happen organically. Each one of these episodes that you have, are they all, is it all specifically on one hand? Is there like an interview? What does the discussion look like in general? Well, it depends on the person. Um, Sometimes it's like, usually it's, they're about 40 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes. Usually it's about half hand and half general discussion. So it's pretty tight. Um, I try to time it to like a workout or something like that. Sometimes the hand is so interesting that it's going to take up more or vice versa, you know, so it it could air either way or the other, but it's fun because there's always going to be some, some strategy, but also some just like more fun talk, which I think is like a nice combination. For sure. I'm more fun talk than strategy. Although I did go on the Just Hands Poker podcast and we talked for one hour about one specific hand, which is actually good practice. Oh, he's great. Jackson was also on your podcast, right? Yeah, yeah. It's that episode's being released tomorrow, which for those of you listening is like historically in the past. Um, He's a great podcaster, though. I think he's really good. And I'm going to be excited to listen to that episode. He's got a really, he's got a really big passion for the end. And he's a good uh, host. And he's smart. Super duper smart. And started playing cards at like 10 years old, which is just ridiculous to me. All right. What's a project you're working on that's near and dear to your heart? uh, And it doesn't have to be poker related necessarily. Well, my work with women in chess is very important to me because I feel like chess, that's the thing about chess. I love poker and I agree with you that it can do amazing things for people's brains and for understanding life and finance and money. But when they are very young, it's hard to teach. So chess is really a great tool to help young people um, learn to focus. And there's not enough girls and women in the game. So um, that's a project I'm working on to kind of get more girls and women into the game by both being an ambassador, fundraising, creating content to inspire them and events. So yeah, I, I run the US Chess Women Program. And I also have a podcast about women in chess as well called Ladies Night. So yeah, for for podcast listeners, Ladies Night and the Poker Grid are my two probably most um, uh, apropos projects. <laughs> and where can so like I mentioned before, I have two young daughters. Um, if I were interested in signing them up for chess, introducing them to this content, where could I find that? Well, my content is I have a book called Play Like a Girl. Um, so I have some content for teaching girls chess, and then I have a lot of. Um, I have a lot of the podcast episodes on ladies night and then I do a lot of things in live events, but I also recommend for girls who don't play chess at all yet to learn online because it's a, it's a good way to just like figure out where the pieces move. Uh, because if you're playing on a screen, it really, um, will show you if you can't make that legal move, you can take it back. And then also playing, um, live gives you that kind of visceral feeling similar to like writing as opposed to typing. So I think a combination of playing online and live just at home at first is perfect. And then, you know, venturing out to real tournaments. You can find me most easily on uh, jennifershahadi.com. And I'm also on Twitter and Instagram at Jen Shahadi. So yeah, that's like, I, I pretty much update all of my videos and podcasts and streaming 
that I do. Um, so it's the easiest way to keep up with me. Nice. I think you just, did I even ask where can the Chasing Poker Gradient <laughs> Greatness audience find you? Um, you just pre-answered the last question. Oh yeah, because you asked me my new project. So I was like, oh how, how yeah, I, how, how do you find you out find about it? my yeah, project? Right, right, right. So I filled it in. <laughs> you filled <See>? it in. <laughs> you did it yourself. Um, thank you today. I'm very, very grateful for the conversation. I, I, I loved it. Yeah, me too. Great inspiration. And thank you so much for having me and good luck with your podcast. I'll definitely be checking out some of those episodes on, on uh, Just Hands Poker and Jungle Man. They sound like they're going to be great. I, I hope so. And um, good, good luck on the grid. And maybe in a few years, if the grid's completed, we'll have you back on and we can talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker Greatness. If you haven't yet subscribed to the show, please take a moment to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be. And once again, I wanted to let you know about PKC Poker. If you're on the lookout for a new poker platform where the games are safe and secure and the action's amazing, head to EnhanceYourEdge.com slash PKCPod to get your code and jump into the games. You must have a code to play as well as be 21 years of age or older. One final time, that's EnhanceYourEdge.com slash PKCPod. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time on Chasing Poker Greatness.